you. This is Jason Cruz from MMA Payout. We are doing another interview series. This time, we are going to be talking about Bruce Lee and an upcoming a 30 for 30 series on ESPN, ESPN coming June 7th. And we are talking to one of the executive producers or the executive producer, Matt, Matthew Polly, who also wrote the, uh, his, his uh, newest book on Bruce Lee. So Matthew, uh, thank you for coming and joining us. I, I appreciate your time and all of that. And, and you're coming to us from the East Coast? I am. I'm here in Connecticut uh, in the middle of the pandemic and uh, great to be talking to another human being. Oh, yeah. No, it's, it's great. To, I, I'm, gr I'm glad we have these types of things so we can actually talk and see that there's actually people on the other side. So uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, it's an interesting backstory. If you don't know uh, anything about Matthew Polly for uh, the uh, the viewers and listeners out there. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came up with the, uh, this, your newest book. So it, it goes all the way back to my childhood. When I was like 12 or 13, I was one of those skinny, scrawny, picked on kids. And I saw Enter the Dragon with Bruce Lee. And he became sort of my childhood hero. I bought a pair of nunchucks, cracked myself in the skull with them, <laughs> like everybody, all Bruce Lee fans must do. It's a rite of passage. Uh, and then uh, eventually I ended up going to the Shaolin Temple in China because in the movie, Bruce Lee was a Shaolin monk. And so that became sort of, I was following in his footsteps. I ended up writing a book about that experience. And then my next book, I did a book about MMA called Tapped Out and which I trained with Randy Couture and various George St. Pierre, various MMA figures of that time. Uh, and then for the third book, I decided I wanted to do something where I didn't get punched in the face. <laughs> uh, and uh, someone suggested you should do Bruce Lee. He he's your childhood hero. Uh, and I assumed there was already a really good biography about him, but it turned out there wasn't. And so I felt like this was how I could honor my hero is to uh, write a proper biography of him. Excellent. So let's go back a little bit to uh, the, the, the Shaolin Temple. So you were, you were going to college at the time, and then you decided to take a break. Uh, how did that come about? Yeah, so I was studying East Asian studies and religion. I was very interested in Zen Buddhism, and the Shaolin Temple is the birthplace of Zen Buddhism and Kung Fu, at least according to the, the mythological history of martial arts, which we, which we know are all sort of made up, but that's what we have to work with. Anyway, uh, the idea of actually going to the place where Bruce Lee was supposedly a monk from and training with the monks in the original style, was it just kind of captivated my young imagination. <laughs> and so I ended up dropping out of college for a couple years. And for two years, I lived at the Shaolin Temple in the early 90s and trained with the monks. So let's, let's, let's <laughs> stop real quick. You were going to Princeton at the time, correct? That's right. I was at Princeton. And... I how did you break it to your parents or yeah, friends and everything like that, that you were going to do this, uh, do this? And then the second part of that question is, how did you get the contact of Shaolin monks so they would agree to this? Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> you know, my father was, is a very conservative Catholic doctor, and he thought he was sending his son off to a nice school to become a doctor like him. And so when I came back and said, Dad, I want to be a Buddhist monk, he, he, was, he was less than happy. Um, <laughs> uh, so that was a long argument. He didn't talk to me for a long time after okay. that. But um, I basically had a little money stored away. And I tried, this was the early 90s. It's hard to remember a world before the internet, basically. Um, and there was no way to figure out where the Shaolin Temple was. China was still relatively closed and also still very poor. Uh, and so basically I just bought a plane to Beijing, um, a plane ticket, landed there and started asking people, do you know where the Shaolin Temple is? <laughs> and, but, so and, uh, sight and see, I mean, how much research did you do before going to China to do this? Uh, almost none. Like there, <laughs> there, It's hard to think about it, but there was no information on the Shaolin Temple except for like some Hong Kong Kung Fu movies. Like 36 Chambers of Shaolin was probably the most research you could do on it. There were no books. <laughs> You couldn't go to a website. There was no Google Maps. Uh, so I literally landed, booked a hotel room, and asked the concierge, like, where, <laughs> where, oh where is the Shaolin Temple? And he didn't know. Uh, he, he, so knew. I took, he knew. He had no idea. Oh, he didn't know. Okay. 
And so I took five days of going around Beijing and asking people. And I finally, in Tiananmen Square, found this old lady. I was like, Shaolin Zainar, where's the Shaolin Temple? Mm -hmm. And she said, I know where it is. It's in my home province. Um, and she said, you know, just go to the train station, get on a train and go to the city and then ask there. So it took like, it took two weeks to find the Shaolin Temple and I just showed up there. So, so um, when you decided to hop on a plane and go uh, go to Beijing, you, you understood, you, you spoke Chinese. So, I, I mean, ma Mandarin? Yeah, Mandarin. Yeah. yeah. And so the plan was just to go ask. <laughs> yeah. Did you? Well, I, I told mean, everybody. How long yeah, were you planning on leave, being there? I, so I thought I would stay for a year because uh, okay. I took a year out of school. Um, right. And... Uh, but I had no idea what was there. I didn't know if it was fake. Like I didn't know if it was destroyed. Um, it was something out of the distant past. So I basically, I mean, I was 20 and you have to be young and dumb to do something uh, that crazy. So you believe uh, the woman, you believe the woman that it was in her home province and then you took a train to, to go there. I was desperate. So I, I had no other option. So I took a train, went to the capital city of that province, booked a hotel, then asked the, the girl, working at the hotel where it was. And she said, Oh, my brother trains at the Shaolin temple. You can grab this bus and go there. And so then I got on a bus and took three hours into the mountains oh and God. got off of it. And there's this tiny little village surrounding the Shaolin temple. It's kind of a tourist attraction. Okay. And, and I found some monks and followed them to a, a, a building and then asked around and asked if I could train. And how, how, do, how were you received? Because I'm a Westerner. I mean, it, it, I, I don't know if that, that happened a lot in the not early 90s or well, what, was, what was it like? No, I was like the first Amer uh, There had been a couple tourist groups show up for a day or two, but nobody had ever shown up and wanted to train for a long period of time. Okay. Um, but it was being run by the Communist Party and their interest was making money. Okay. And so when they saw me, they just said, you know, it's 1300 bucks a month. Um, <laughs> and, and if you've got that, then you can train here. And so I, I that said, uh, room and board and food and everything like that. Yeah. Room, board, food, and training. It, it turned out they were ripping me off. It was actually only 500 bucks a month. But <laughs> <laughs> it took me a couple months to figure out I was getting uh, screwed. But, uh, um, you know, uh, basically, I had one-on-one -on -one training with a Shaolin monk for six hours a day, so it was pretty amazing. How okay? How how much had you learned beforehand, or were you just a, a complete novice when you went into the t t temple? Was there? I mean, what did they think of you and your your ability? Yeah, so I had had maybe three years of training. I'd done some Taekwondo, the typical American, like some Aikido, mm -hmm. some Taekwondo, a little um, Southern Kung Fu. And I was training the first day and one of the monks, they were all watching me because they thought it was fascinating, this, this tall white American there. <laughs> uh, and one of them looked at me and he said, how long have you trained for? And I said, about two years. And he goes, it looks like two weeks. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was basically like if you were a pretty good high school basketball player and then you got drafted by the NBA. Um, it, that's what it felt like. It was like being on the Chicago Bulls as a high school basketball player. Um, and did they, so... Did they take advantage of you in any way? Kind of like beat you up just to prove a point? Did they do a lot of uh, physical exertion to the point of breaking? What did they, did they do? Or were they very nice? Uh, in general, they tried to be nice because they their feeling is that white people can't do martial arts. And so... <laughs> they were treating me like you would like a kind of panda, like you were like really careful around this big cute thing. <laughs> uh, um, uh, but there were a couple guys there when I started after I trained there for a little bit, then I started doing the kickboxing mm -hmm. uh, and every Chinese guy wants to beat up a white guy. And so <laughs> there was like a long line of people who wanted to challenge me to a sparring match. Oh my gosh. I, so so my, Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. So my coach would have to turn most of them down. Okay. And then there were a few people like coaches from different schools would come over and be like, I want to spar the American. <sighs> um, 
So I, I ended up uh, in a lot of sparring matches with random people. So were you the only uh, Westerner that was that was training there at the time? Yeah, I was oh, the only one. Wow, wow. And uh, what type of things, like in a normal, you said six, six days a week, what normal regimen, how many hours, what kind of things? Were you doing striking? Were you doing weightlifting, endurance? What, what type of things? Yeah, so they the training was kind of, it wasn't quite what MMA is today, but it wasn't the way we think of the old school where they're jumping on top of tree trunks. Okay. Um, so it's like, it was calisthenics. You, it was six hours a day. You would wake up and run up the mountain. So you would do some road work. Uh, and then you do calisthenics, stretching, and then you practice the form, whatever form you were working on. Or if you're kickboxing, it would be like a kickboxing class. You do kicks against pads, against heavy bags, sparring. So it, it looked a lot like, um, you would train in any sort of dojo in a strip mall in America, you know? Okay. Okay. And, and then like, as far as, uh, your diet and food, like what did, what were you fed and, uh, how, how, how was the food? I, I, I don't. <laughs> so I, I, it was in Hunan province and okay. there's a reason there's no Hunan style of, uh, food <laughs> yeah. in America Okay. because even in China, they think Hunan province food sucks. So, <laughs> So basically it was bad Chinese all day, all day long. Oh, and I would have to, I taught them how to make French fries. That was sort of the really? same. Okay. You had potato. Okay. Wow. Because they, they thought dunking potatoes in that much grease, uh, oil was a waste of oil. Sure. Cause I mean, <laughs> sure. well, and they try to, you can't reuse it or anything like that. Exactly. You can't reuse it. So, but anyway, they got good at making French fries for me and I tried to teach them how to do hamburgers, but they couldn't quite master that. Oh my goodness. That, that, that is very interesting. And you're, and, um, so did you do anything else outside of the training? Um, uh, did you go visit other, I mean, areas tour, like, I mean, or was it just like your seventh day when you rested, you just were just so, uh, so tired that you, you know, yeah, had to just sleep. <laughs> Uh, yeah, mostly. It, so we trained six days a week. And so on the seventh day, mostly you were exhausted. But after a year, your body gets adjusted to it. And so you're able to kind of take breaks or, you know, you take a week off. And so I did get to visit other parts of China. Um, but mostly it was like, I would catch a train to Beijing so I could go to McDonald's. <laughs> that was, I was like, I don't really want to see the Great Wall. I want a McDonald's. Yeah. So being being stuck in a place that's you know a very tiny village um all men uh doing martial arts all day long was amazing but you would you miss certain things so going you would go to big cities to just go to a nightclub or something i see i see and then so what at what point did you decide that that was enough or you you needed to move on uh i think by I, so I fought a tournament there and uh, took second place and did quite well. And I felt like by the end of two years, I, I had a pretty good grasp of what they were teaching there. Okay. I wasn't a master by any means, but I was pretty decent. And, you know, also at some point you realize there's no future as a amateur Chinese kickboxer. Uh, so I should probably go back and get my degree and get a job. Nice. Um, and also, you start to miss home. Sure, sure. And so before before we leave China, talk about we leave our talk about China, did you uh, or did they know about Bruce Lee and the Shaolin Temple and all of that that stuff and the reasons for why people were enamored with it? Um, so they yes. So the Shaolin monks love movies, and in fact, okay. a couple of them went on to become Hong Kong stuntmen. Okay. <laughs> so so a lot of the they actually, there's a Jet Li's first movie was called Shaolin Temple, mm -hmm. and it was a huge hit in China, and that's a, a lot of the reason why many of the monks went there. Okay. And so they knew Bruce Lee, uh, and they could imitate his moves. They're like, yeah, they would do that joking around. So yeah, they knew who Bruce Lee was. Did they did they revere him, or did they kind of like, oh, Bruce Lee? I mean, I could I'm, I could be Bruce Lee too. Or uh, what was the kind of respect or you know, really, uh, assessment of his own, of Bruce Lee's martial arts skills. They actually would sit around and talk about it and they would sort of, uh, they're very analytical. So they'd be like, oh yeah, he was really fast, but his roundhouse kick was a little stiff. Um, and so they would, they would break down Bruce Lee's sort of techniques. <laughs> um, 
in the same way they would break down Jackie Chan or, or the rest of them. They, they, anything martial arts related, they would be very specific. In fact, uh, one of the things I did for them is like all the movies were Hong Kong movies where it's a Chinese guy beating up white guys. <laughs> and I got, I got kind of tired of that. So I brought back a Steven Seagal and a Jean-Claude Van Damme movie. <laughs> <laughs> what did they think of that? <laughs> well, they were, it, they were most interested in Van Damme because he was so muscular and they were oh, like, yeah. man, he's huge. And the splits they liked, but they kept saying, well, those techniques are really slow. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like he's too big. That's why he's so slow, but he must be really strong. That's uh, what what did, that was their assessment yeah, of Van Damme. Yeah. What did they think of Seagal's, uh, whatever style he had? Um, in yeah. The that kind of the brutal Aikido. Yeah. They thought it was interesting. They, they had they don't do that kind of uh, sweeping hand twisting stuff sure um but they know they'd seen it before so they thought it was interesting but they weren't that impressed with him <laughs> i see i see to be honest uh so uh, i wanted to kind of jump up ahead to your your bruce lee book the, the, the your your latest book um yeah. tell me a little bit about it how, how the process and and developing it and um how long it, it had took to to, come, uh, to get it Done. Yeah, it took from start to finish. It took about uh, seven years. Oh wow! Um, so I took uh, I spent a year basically in Hong Kong interviewing friends, family members, uh, and then a long time in L.A. where he had a lot of colleagues when he was in Hollywood, and then reading everything that ever existed on Bruce Lee and watching all the documentaries and the films and clips of him. And then putting it all together in sort of one document and then trying to like congeal it into a single book story so that it had a through line and it felt like you were reading a novel more than like, you know, some boring academic paper. Uh, and uh, yeah, that entire process took a, a long, long time. Oh, and certain things, for example, his death was a mystery. Um, and so it took a long time talking to experts on, you know, heat stroke experts on cerebral edema so i wanted to sort of go into all different sort of aspects of bruce lee's life interesting and then so when you were in hong kong how did you get in touch with family members friends of bruce lee things like that people like that yeah so i uh i hired a um i speak mandarin but not cantonese the southern okay. dialect mm -hmm. so i hired someone who could speak cantonese uh and to help me out sort of making contacts and I knew uh, I had sort of one or two people who had connected me with people in Hong Kong. And I just basically kind of spread out through there. I talked to one person, interviewed them, said, can you put me in touch with oh. this person? And then they put me in touch with somebody else. And so that, that was the process. Um, but it, yeah, it's a, it takes a long time. The other thing is uh, the Chinese are less comfortable talking about somebody famous than Americans because they feel a little bit like they're riding on somebody else's coattails. <clears throat> um, and so it took more convincing to get people to open up. Did, were people, um, the people that you interviewed, were they concerned about telling stories about Bruce Lee? Were they, um, uh, did they, ex was there an expectation for them to say nice things? How, how was the interview process? Yeah, so some of the people have been interviewed multiple times before, and so they were very, very comfortable. The problem with people who are comfortable is they've told the same version of the story many times, and so it's harder to dig out sort of a, a more honest or fresh response. Uh, and then the then I got to some people who hadn't been interviewed before. For example, his uh, some of his childhood classmates when he was in grade school. Uh, and they were telling stories about how he was a bit of a bully. And so they, they were uh, uncomfortable telling the story because Bruce Lee's such an icon, they don't want to be accused of running him down. Uh, so you do have that problem of, you, I would interview somebody and I, at the end I'd be like, so why don't you tell me one thing that wasn't good about Bruce Lee? <laughs> <laughs> because, were they worried about telling the story? Yeah, you would get... Yeah, of course. There, Bruce Lee has like hardcore fans. Sure. You don't want to be the person who says something bad and then right. the fans ride you on Twitter. Um, and so you did have to, you had to make it clear that you wanted, I was like, I'm telling an honest book. 
you know, the good and the bad. I'm not trying to sell him. I'm just trying to tell who he really was. And once they got comfortable knowing that you weren't judging them, like I wouldn't be upset if they said, oh, well, Bruce had a temper or something like that. Um, then it was easier. But yeah, they, you could tell there were certain people who were very worried. Every once in a while, though, I would find somebody who genuinely didn't like Bruce Lee. <laughs> really? really? Yeah. And then they were like, oh, boy, I'm going to unload. Uh, and so you would, you would occasionally get people who uh, had been waiting a long, you know, 40 years to tell me why Bruce Lee was a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> Did, uh, so was there, uh, I mean, I, I assume there's an enormous amount of fact checking involved in trying to double and triple check that the stories that uh, were verified yeah. and, and, and real, not just someone trying to make stuff up. Yes. So um, the, the advantage I had is because so much has been written about Bruce Lee and he's been covered and people have been talked to for years that for almost every anecdote in his life, I, there's like four different versions. Um, for example, he, when he was 17, he was in a box, a Western boxing match, a kind of intercollegiate school match. Mm -hmm. And there were four different versions. One, he knocked out the guy in 30 seconds. Another one that it took three rounds and he kept knocking him down, but he couldn't finish him. So you would get different versions and you could compare them and get a sense of kind of who was telling the truth and who wasn't. Okay. And then you would know, oh, this guy tends to make up stories and you would discount him later on for different versions of his stories. So it felt oftentimes like being a police officer, like <laughs> I was bringing people in. I'd be like, OK, this guy's kind of a liar. I have to be careful with him or this one's pretty reliable. I can trust his accounts. Gotcha. I gotcha. And then so did you uh, talk to the family as well? Shannon or? I, uh, yeah. Yeah, I did. I so I saw. I talked to his daughter Shannon. Interviewed her. Okay. I talked to his widow uh, wife Linda Lee, uh, and I talked to his sister Phoebe, uh, and then I had some email exchanges with his younger brother Robert. So okay. I I pretty much covered his entire family. Oh wow. Okay. Well, so, and then ha explain to us how how it became a uh, thirty for ESPN thirty for thirty. That's it's it's so interesting from from this to now. Uh, what we'll see in a couple of weeks. Yeah. So um, basically when the book came out, it did quite well and was well reviewed. It's sort of the authoritative biography of Bruce Lee. And so I got called from s several different groups of producers interested in uh, turning the book into a documentary and the ESPN team uh, director Bao had been working on his own version of a Bruce Lee documentary for years before my book came out. And so I felt like he had the most knowledge and background. So I went with the ESPN team, they optioned my book, and then the director and the producers went out and did what I did. They re-interviewed everybody and put them on camera uh, and put the documentary together. Interesting, and what was your, pro was there any other process that you had to help out with the documentary itself? So uh, primarily I was a kind of Rolodex. Like okay. they would say, um, who do you know? How can, can you get us in touch with so-and-so? Um, what should we ask? So I kind of helped prep them for some of the interview process. Uh, but when I met with director Bao, I said to him, you know, this is your baby. I've already written my book. Uh, so you should do whatever you want to do and make it yours. And so he made, you know, aside from helping them set up some interviews, the documentary is really his project. And he, he went the direction he, he was interested in. And I assume it's, you're very pleased with how the final product came out? Yeah, I think it's a very, it's the most thorough and complete documentary ever put, ever put together. Um, of course, you know, everybody, you could, oh, you should have done this or you should have done that. But it's really his, his vision of Bruce Lee. And he comes from an Asian American background. And so I think he really got to bring that part of the story of Bruce Lee as an Asian American icon mm -hmm. to the screen. And that's, I think, what makes this documentary special. And then so uh, from your perspective from the book, is there something that um, in the special that you want people to obtain from the 30 from 30 after when viewing it? Yeah, I think the most important thing, it's hard for us to understand how difficult what Bruce Lee achieved was, which was to become the first Chinese American male actor to ever star in a Hollywood movie. He was facing a level of racism, which today we just can't quite conceive of. 
and it was simply impossible. Like the idea of him starring in uh, Enter the Dragon was inconceivable. And it took like an incredible amount of ambition, talent, and sheer will and the unwillingness to give up. And some argue it's what cost him his life. He basically like spent all of his energy trying to achieve this dream. And so I think it really is the story of what a single man can achieve if he's willing to sacrifice everything for it. Interesting, interesting. So um, the ESPN 30 for 30, uh, B-Water, is, is that what it's? Yeah, uh, B-Water. B-Water, June, June 7th, uh, it, right. it, it uh, comes out. It'll probably be as big as the last dance. <laughs> you know, well, like, nothing's going to be bigger than Jordan. So well, yeah. I mean, you know, not everybody was a fan of the, of the Bulls in the '90s. I, I, I tell I tell friends. So, but a lot of people were fran- fans of Bruce Lee. True. Um, so, uh, tell us first of all, uh, aside from the documentary, uh, wh- where you could buy the book, the book Bruce Lee Alive. Yeah, so it's available everywhere. It's on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, um, independent bookshops should have it as well. So, you know, it's still out there and totally available. And your website is mattpolly.com, correct? That's right. Thank you. And I'm also on Twitter, Matthew E. Polly. And I, uh, I respond to fans and anybody who has questions. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time, Matthew. Uh, what is next for you if, you, if, the, if there's anything uh, on the horizon? Or are you just focusing on, on this book, on the 30 for 30 right now? Well, certainly the 30 30 for right now, but uh, I'm, I'm thinking about another biography and I may do the comedian George Carlin. Interesting. Very interesting. Well, that, that we will look forward to that, hopefully, in, in the not too distant future. But, you know, you're an author, so take your time. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's a decade from now. I'll call you again. <laughs> take your time. Take your time. So, Matt, thank you so much for your time. And once again, uh, June 7th on ESPN uh, 30 for 30, uh, the Bruce Lee documentary, Be Water. So uh, look out for that. Once again, Jason Cruz from MMA Payout. Thank you, Matthew. I appreciate your time. Thanks for having me on.